Welcome to Sunday School at First Baptist Church. My name is Melissa Wilson, and I'm glad that you are joining us for Sunday School. Today's lesson is entitled Intoxicated with the Spirit, or by the Spirit, and it's based on Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 19. Um, before we get started in that, let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today, and thank you that we can gather together to study your word. Um, even though we may be sitting in our own homes this morning, um, we are united in one spirit as we open your scriptures to learn from their truth. Help us to have a deeper understanding of you and your character and your will for us through studying your scriptures. Lord, help us to apply what we learn to where we can more closely reflect you to those around us. We thank you for the gift of your scriptures and our ability to study them. In your son's most precious and holy name, amen. All right, so today's scriptures come from Ephesians, and it's just two verses in Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 18 through 19, and I'm going to read those aloud to you now. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Now, I don't want to be misunderstood here. There is a lot of content just in those two verses. But at the same time, there's much more to this. And looking, taking a closer look at the context surrounding this, will help us understand these scriptures even more. Paul, in writing to the church at Ephesus, is describing Christian life as a spiritual battle. And in order to proceed on this journey, we should rely on the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Paul commands us to be filled with the Spirit. Paul contrasts this life of being filled with the Spirit with a life of darkness. But how is that, but how is it that this being filled with the Spirit, how is it that we accomplish that? What are we supposed to do? The Greek word here that is used is actually passive, which means we can't do anything. God is the one who is the active agent who fills us with the Spirit. We must learn to yield ourselves to God in total surrender. So before we delve deeper into today's scripture, we need to familiarize ourselves with the context. In chapter 4 of Ephesians, Paul is instructing the Ephesians about the walk of a Christ follower. He warns them to no longer walk as those without Christ, and demonstrates the folly of living as unbelievers that grieve the Holy Spirit. And the blessings of spiritual principles that bring glory to God. At the beginning of chapter 5, Paul challenges us to be imitators of Christ. And walk as children of light and not sons of disobedience. And this brings us to the passage for today. While today's scriptures are verses 18 and 19. These verses should be read in the larger context of verses 15 through 21. So we'll actually begin our study there. So let me read to you this entire passage of Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. And this is this breakdown, this cluster of verses being put together is because of the way of the structure and the grammar of the passage that this was all meant to be read in relation to one another and together. So beginning in verse 15, therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine for that is dissipation but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, 
always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. All right. So now we have these two verses that we're going to look more deeply at, but we're looking at them in the context of this whole passage. So Paul instructs the Ephesians, to be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. All right. This is present tense command, which means we're to be continually aware of our circumstances, acting as wise people and not foolish people. Um, as Christians, we are called to be alert and aware to our surroundings. We are not to just move through life with blinders on, not paying attention to what's going on around us. Um, we need to be actively involved and engaged in our community and with those around us. And in order to do that, we have to be looking around. We have to be active and involved and being careful that we are acting in wise ways. That next little part of the passage says, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Wise people make good use of their time. Greek has two concepts of time. Chronos, which we think of as chronological time. And then Kairos, which is passing opportunities. Um, I like to think of these as divine appointments. Um, we have to be aware of the time we are giving. In our Sunday school materials that I read, um, in the commentary, it mentioned that somebody once advertised, lost yesterday somewhere between sunrise and two, sunset, two golden hours, each with 60 diamond minutes. No reward offered, for they are gone forever. It also mentioned Jonathan Edwards, who during the great, was useful, was working during the Great Awakening of 1734 and 1735 with um, sermons and preaching, was very active and involved during that time, wrote in his resolutions right before he turned 20, resolved never to lose one moment of time, but to improve it in the most profitable way I possibly can. When I read these two passages about these two hours being gone and how I never want to lose a moment of time, I can't help but think of the hourglass that is sitting in my office and how it serves as a reminder that the moments that we have right now are passing and we only get to live and experience each moment once. So how am I making the most of that moment? How am I using that um, to grow in my own Christian walk, but also to draw others to Christ. So as a Christ follower, we are to be on the lookout for what I like to think of as these divine appointments, where God gives us the opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus to those that we encounter. We never know when these moments may hit, but this is the very heart of Kyrios time. We have moments that if we are not looking for them can pass us by and they will not come again. These moments where we can demonstrate God's love to others. Paul then cautions us to not be foolish, but to understand what the will of the Lord is. The particulars of God's will is different for each of us. But the primary desire for us is not just good behavior or right theology. That's not what God is looking for. Are those things important? Yes, but that's not God's main focus. God's primary will for us is to know is for us to know Him. One of my professors in seminary, when we were looking at Matthew and it talked about Joseph being righteous, um, defined righteousness as knowing and doing the will of God. And that concept has really stuck with me. So when Paul says that we need to understand what the will of the Lord is, it makes sense because how can we do the will of the Lord if we don't know what it is? So knowing and doing leads to righteousness. 
in today's passage, we see Paul commanding us not to get drunk on wine, but to be filled with the Spirit. So it says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Why would Paul make this reference? Well, there are several different suggestions, so let me run through those with you so that you're aware of them. One, he could have been cautioning them about being like the Corinthian church that drank too much wine at the Lord's table. But this doesn't seem likely because the text isn't more specific in referencing that. Some other people believe that this is not a comparison at all, believing that Paul would not make such a comparison. However, we do see this in other places in Scripture. Luke talked about John being filled with the Spirit, um, and the apostles at Pentecost were mistaken for being intoxicated because they were filled with the Spirit. So, this one doesn't really stand up to me either. Another suggestion was that Paul was combating the pagan celebrations involving the Greek god of wine, Dionysus, where his followers were inebriated, hoping to gain spiritual insight by being filled with wine. While this is a fascinating interpretation, and it's kind of tempting to want to jump there, there's nothing to directly connect the church at Ephesus to pagan worship. So I don't know that in the context that that makes the most sense. The most likely scenario is that Paul was simply using the well-known example of Roman debauchery as a foil to contrast the behavior of an unbelieving world with the proper behavior of a believing church filled with the Spirit of God. I don't know about you, but when I think of a person who has become intoxicated, I think of someone who is no longer in control of themselves. They have lost the ability to make good choices. They have surrendered their self-control, their very will, to a substance. The Bible refers to this as wastefulness and wild living. We see that in the example of the prodigal son. And while there is clear instruction not to become intoxicated, there's never a blanket prohibition against alcohol at all. That matter is always left up to the individual conscience. As Christians, we are to surrender our control or our will only to God, not to other substances. And in surrendering to the Holy Spirit, we are able to rightly know and do the will of God. Moving on, be filled with the Spirit. This term is passive, like I mentioned earlier, which means it is God who fills us. We cannot fill ourselves. We are to make ourselves available to God as vessels ready to be filled. We need to be ready for God to direct our lives. And this verb is in present tense, so it is repetitive. This means that a person is not filled with the Holy Spirit one time, and then we can mark that off our list and it's done. We don't need to worry about that anymore. Um, we must be continually filled. I like to think of it as a car with a gas tank. I don't know about you, but I have to put gas in my car all the time because it's continually using it up. When we are living in God's will, when we are walking the Christian journey the way we should, we need to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit, um, just like the tank in my car. We must surrender ourselves daily to God's leadership through the Holy Spirit. So, the next verse says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Speaking here, where it says speaking to that one another with psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit, from the Spirit. Speaking is not just referring to conversation, but it's also about song and making music. And there are three different musical terms that are used here. The first one is psalms. 
And this is the one that we are probably the most familiar with because there's a whole book of them in our Bible um, in the Old Testament. And the term psalms refers to songs originally accompanied by harps. It most often refers to those included in the Old Testament um, book, but in the New Testament, this term was also used to refer to spontaneous compositions which were performed as something new in a manner similar to a previous one. So I understand that to mean that they would take the tune that they had put together to one of the Psalms in the Old Testament and maybe shifted the words around some, or maybe they had taken the words and shifted the music. We do this all the time in worship. Um, in my seminary class, we had to take a class on worship, and one of the things the professors taught us was that how you teach a congregation a new song, how you add hymns and songs into a congregation's repertoire, is that you, you have a couple options. You either take familiar words and put them to a new tune, or you take a familiar tune and put them to new words. Because if one of the two, either the words or the tune, is familiar, it's easier for us to connect to it and to be able to sing it. And so whenever I read this about the Psalms that it's talking about in the New Testament, that it's referring to spontaneous compositions that are like similar ones, it makes me think of that. Um, there's several times that in worship that I'll hear a tune and I'm thinking it's going to be one song and then it's a different one. I'm like, oh, I didn't realize those used the same one. So um, it's a clever thing that we've been doing for quite a while in church. All right. Um, you can actually even look in your hymnal and in the back, I just picked one up because it was seeing here. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there is an index of tunes. Yes, there is. And back here you can see where several songs have the same tune. And if I had looked ahead, I could have told you some that went all together. Let me see. I don't know if these are ones that we do, but this is kind of fun. Okay, so... Number 32, God has spoken by the prophets, apparently has the same tune as 217. That's not a hymn I was familiar with. Alleluia, sing to Jesus. And also 310, Alleluia, sing to Jesus. I know that one. So they can have several different words set to them. And that is just fascinating to me. I don't know about you, but you ought to look at it sometime when you've got a chance to um, joyful, joyful, we adore thee and alleluia, sing to Jesus. Apparently have the same tune, or at least this version of them do. Um, I know the one that gets me sometimes is come thou fount. There's a couple different tunes it can be set to. All right. Moving on, hymns is used in secular Greek for a festive lyric in praise of a god or hero. While there were pagan hymns that were sung at a temple north of Ephesus, the Ephesian Christians were to offer their hymns to worship the one true God and Lord Jesus Christ. And then the third musical term mentioned here was songs from the Spirit. And from my reading, that appears to be spontaneous in nature. So, in the next part, it says, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So, it may seem odd to call it speaking to one another or to each other, but we do this all the time in worship. Um, the song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. 
when we're singing that song, we are joining together and talking about who God is. But it doesn't have to say, a mighty fortress are you, God, for it to be worship. A mighty fortress is our God, is worship. Um, it's in declaring that truth about God to one another, that in itself is an act of worship. And we recognize that as a form of worship. Um, the next part says, sing and make music or making melody with your heart to the Lord. Well, this making music from your heart, that maybe sounds like something you do internally or inaudibly. Um, it probably is better understood as making music in a heartfelt way with sincerity and with emotion, with feeling. Uh, when we sing and make music to God, it is to be with enthusiasm and sincerity. Um, worship is a chance for us to pour out ourselves to God. Um, it's about expressing what we think and feel and believe and know about God, expressing all of that to God. And so that should evoke some sort of emotion in us. I know that during the past several weeks as we've been able to start regathering for worship, one of the most difficult things for me is to hear the hymns that I grew up with, that I'm familiar with, that have always been a part of my worship experience, to hear those played and sung in worship and to refrain from singing them. Um, I love to sing. Unfortunately, I'm not very good at it, but I love to sing as a part of worship. And while I'm refraining, even behind my mask, from singing, um, it's hard at times because you almost want to do it, you almost do it reflexively, just out of, that's what you do. Um, it's, it's almost like a triggered response there. And so I really have to concentrate there in worship when the songs are going on that I don't forget and start singing because um, with the pandemic going on, we have to be careful about that right now. But that's been a struggle for me. I'm looking forward to when we get to sing and worship again, and I can't wait us to be able to do that because I have a feeling that there will be singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord like we haven't seen in quite a while. And then verses 20 and 21 go on to say, always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. As we journey on this Christian walk, as we um, do our best to emulate Christ and to be Christ followers, we are to always be thankful. Um, I know that I have struggled at times with thankfulness um, during the past several months because our lives have shifted so much. Things have changed dramatically. Um, I was particularly thankful for this past Sunday when we got to do a little outside activity with the kids and we tie-dyed face masks. And the kids were just here for a few minutes um, got to have a little bit of interaction with them as we tied out our face masks, but it did my heart a world of good to get to be around them and see them and have some interaction. And I think that we have to remember that this is temporary, the situation we're in right now, and that we will be back um, eventually to what we view as a more normal worship and um, life experience. But even in the heart of this difficult time that we have right now, there is still so much that we can be thankful for. Um, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. We need to remember, especially now as our country seems so divided, um, it seems like everything is this huge debate to wear a mask or not to wear a mask? Should we go to school all week long, five days a week, or just a few days, or virtually? 
everything just seems so divisive. And when I read this about be subject to one another in the fear of Christ, to me, what I hear there is none of us have all the answers. And I know that I am as guilty as anyone as thinking of thinking that I have it all figured out. If you just ask me, I know what's best. I know exactly what we should do. And if everybody listened to me, we would be just fine. But a deeper part of me knows that that's not true. Do I have my opinions? Do I think I know what would work the best? Sure, I do. But this doesn't say be subject to Melissa in fear of Christ. It says be subject to one another. That means that we are to respect one another and to hear one another out and to, tr to understand that part of following Christ means recognizing Christ in others as well. And right now that can be really hard to do. So I want to encourage you, especially this week and in the coming weeks, as we see more and more divisive talk, in, particularly in social media, but also just in the community and in your daily conversations, in your emails, and all of that. When you see division, remind yourself of this verse that we are to be subject to one another. That doesn't mean that I'm not entitled to my opinion, but it does mean that I have a responsibility to not hold myself out over other people, to treat others with kindness and respect. And I also think it's worth saying that we need to be aware that whatever situation or issue that is being that is the source of the division right now, likely is temporary. So let's not do permanent damage over a temporary issue. Um, so all that to say, treat one another with kindness and um, let's assume the best of each other. So in conclusion, the more we make ourselves available to God, the more we will be ready to be filled with his spirit. Paul is telling us to make ourselves available to God. We are like vessels ready to be filled. So, make sure that this week you are ready to be filled so that you can rightly know and do the will of God. Thank you for joining me for Sunday School this morning. Um, Shortly, our worship will go live, and we hope that you join us for worship as well.